Good morning and welcome as we gather here both in person and online. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 15 and before we do that though I'd like to start with a song and we know I'm going to start with a prayer actually. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father we thank you for the love that you have for us. As we gather here today whether in person or online may your Holy Spirit fill us in you. May we grow in your love and above all be blessed by what you give us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start with that song, Jordan Stormy Banks. pictures of Jesus looking like this. Rugged good looks, nice wavy hair and square jawline. This is what people often expect Jesus to look like and a leader to be. Someone who you look at them and you think you can depend on them. But when it comes to the leaders of the world, this is what we're left with. Nothing like the way we would anticipate. But these are the people that we around the world have put our trust into to lead our nations. Probably not the most flattering pictures of them, but they are at any one point in time world leaders. We look at Jesus as being like this, God gives us this. Because, I'm not saying it about all the people on this, but when in the Old Testament when God wanted a leader for his people, he did not look at how they looked or their, their build or their size or anything like that. He looked upon the heart. And we, when we look at this picture, we think, well, I should have had our Prime Minister up there because as a Christian, he is someone that has a heart after the Lord. And we are blessed to have that for our nation. I'm not sure that everyone in the picture there by any means would be a follower of Jesus Christ. But this is what the world has. And we know that 
when we look at Christ, we can trust him because when he puts people in places, he does so because he looks upon that heart. And we are to have hearts for God, so when he sees what we do, he can say, there is one of mine down there, doing a wonderful job, and he keeps an eye on each and every one of us. So kids out there or anyone watching, make sure your heart is in the right place so that God can see it and that he can call you where he wants you to go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you watch over us. Let us have a heart that is right for you, that all we do, we may do it for, your, for, for you because you are worthy of everything that we have. There is nothing we deserve to come before you, but out of your grace, you gave us your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us not waste that beautiful opportunity, but to grow through that. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Now, because Jesus Christ is our cornerstone, let's stand and sing it. Here we go.
as we have our reading from 1 Samuel chapter 15. Good morning, our reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 15 beginning at verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliam and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Go, for that reading. Who can remember what it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6? Anyone? Any takers? This is what it says. The Lord re uh, regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. That's scary language from the Bible, isn't it? God had seen the wickedness that had come from the human heart and God was grieved. It was at this point he was about to wipe out the human race right off the planet. That was until he found favour in Noah. And we could all say thank you, Noah, for standing up for what is right and good. In our world today, we think we have every right under the sun and have everything stitched up. We think we have the right to say what we want and do what suits us and believe whatever fits. For God is not going to flood the world again. He made a promise. So what harm is there in speaking our minds or acting the way we want to? But that statement for the Lord 
regretting the making of human beings is deeply disturbing. It goes beyond our human condition and understanding because we cannot think like God does. Therefore, we cannot comprehend how the statement plays out in the heavenly realms. We know that God is fiercely jealous of his creation. And it's just as we cannot fathom the, the statement in reading from 1 Samuel that we heard from Gail just before, when the author said, And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. If we look at it through human eyes and, and we thought that about a leader, most people would not say a thing. They would not make it public, for it would show a sign of vindictiveness or even bitter about a choice that was made. And it is in the same vein, almost, I, I said as a mother saying, this is my favourite child, and this is not. What kind of mother would do that? The first issue, though, that we find in this passage is to approach, uh, is whether God made a mistake when he said that. Did he speak his mind, thought, whoops, shouldn't have done that? The quick answer is no, God does not make mistakes nor does he contradict himself. That's what we humans do. We make mistakes and contradict ourselves. Some will say that the Bible contains contradictions, but at the end of the day, these people do not really fully grasp the word of God, or they lack the skills of knowing how to understand it. As we heard last week, the people of Israel, they wanted a king. They were informed by God as how to how king will treat them. Not how he may treat them, but how he will treat them. And still they persevered with their desire. We want because others have. Often the desire of what is wanted is driven by a sincere vision of a perfect future. But we know this does not happen. There will always be things that arise when people will begin to peel away from embracing change. God warned the people that they didn't they didn't want to change their minds. They wanted a king. And they got what they asked for. For Saul was pretty much a secular king. He didn't listen to God, but he did what he deemed was right. Samuel told Saul, as an example, to go to Gilgal and prepare to fight against the Philistines. And Saul instructed him to wait seven days for Samuel to arrive. And when Samuel arrives, he's supposed to give an offering and give instruction to Saul. But did Saul listen to Samuel? No, he did not. When Samuel had not yet arrived, Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. And it was Saul who offered up the burnt offering. Was Saul a priest? No, he was not. Did Saul have the authority to act in this manner? No, he did not. And when Samuel got there and found what he had done, he said, You have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord of your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. This is what happens when the people believe they know what the kingdom of God needs. This is what happens when people bring human desires into the mix of God's plan. We know the general population look for a hero model to lead them. Probably not from the photographs I put up earlier, but someone who holds superhuman abilities while fulfilling the whim of all who desire such leadership. And as the nation of Israel found out, there are flaws to this approach. Firstly, when people get what they ask for, it will not be of God. And secondly, everyone has different perspectives of what is needed, which we can whittle down to a position where a consultancy document would not be agreed by all. And we see that in our own nation when it comes to voting. We go backwards and forwards between the major parties because people are chasing what they want. The people will list what they want in their leader, but is it what God has in mind? Saul did not fit God's position description, but he ticked the people's box. 
And so God spoke to Samuel saying, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send to you, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. For Samuel to fill his horn with oil meant one thing. Oil was for anointing. It was God's way of saying, this person gets my seal of approval. And so Samuel goes out to meet the sons of Jesse that were gathered for him to seek the one of God's favour. As Samuel passed by them one by one, the answer was no. We read though, how in his heart Samuel thought, maybe it's this one. In typical human shortcoming, the view was on the physical status, while God showed what he was looking for. For the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or his height or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Samuel was just simply being human. But God had specific plans. Samuel said to Jesse, are these all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. When God cleared Samuel's mind of human thought, Samuel clearly summons David, the shepherd boy. Even in the narrative, the author continues to give an earthly commentary. He was ruddy with beautiful eyes and was handsome. I'm sure God wasn't saying, write this down, but he was like, he is, and he put it in the text. And that's okay if he was hoping to capture a bride or a farmer wants a wife or something like that. But this was about anointing a king. We know that Saul was rough with a vision for the people. He was a warrior, a fighter. David was soft with a heart for what God desired. When sin Saul sinned, he argued his case. When David sinned, he offered heartfelt repentance. Saul didn't really care for anybody, but David, as king, cared for the nation. And we know Saul nearly never humbled himself, but David did. After anointing David, Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. And as he did so, we become very much aware of two things. The first one is that God removed the spirit from Saul. And one could argue that the spirit didn't really have that much effect on Saul, for he wrestled against everything against it every step of his time as king. He was not walking necessarily where God was calling him. He did not listen to the prophets. He even went as far as to summon a witch to speak to the dead Samuel, this is in the future time, to ask advice because he did not know where to go or what to do. And God said, don't do this. How can the Spirit of God tolerate this? The other fact is we find the true status of Saul once that spirit of God had left him. For the spirit of God did not make him a better human, but more aligned with the will of God, which he ignored a good deal of the time anyway. Which brings us to us. How well do we walk with God? Knowing we are saved through Jesus Christ, and now having the Holy Spirit not sit upon us, but dwell within us. Are we so innocent as doves that we don't send shudders through that Holy Spirit when we do things that are wrong? We are privileged to have David in the history sitting upon the throne of Israel. For by doing so, the word of God came to fruition as the tribe of Judah would occupy that space throughout history. Right up to the time when Judah was taken by the Babylonians 
and King Zedekiah was removed from that throne, and the world waited for the monarch of Judah to reign again, this time with Jesus Christ at the helm. His reign allowed us to be adopted into that tribe, that promise, and that family. Like David, we too must repent and seek forgiveness, not putting ourselves above anything else. We too, like Jesus, must love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbours as ourselves. For to grieve the Holy Spirit, that spirit that dwells within us, puts us into the territory of the enemy, literally. And we can read through media statements and little want-to-be bloggers out there on the internet. And there's not always an air of grace in what they say, not even from some Christians. And this can be found in leadership capacity as well. And uh, some would say, uh, you know, how do we respond to such leadership? But in the instance of today's reading, the leadership change was clearly a change from human desire to God ordained. I love this little quote from Charles Swindoll. He said, in other words, Jesus went into the desert to confront his enemy and throw down the gauntlet. He would prove himself to be the legitimate shepherd of Israel by overcoming the temptations that had undone all of Israel's previous kings including his mighty ancestor, King David. We know David was not a perfect leader, for no human outside the physical being of Christ is or was perfect. That did not stop God from ordaining imperfect people to run his nation or to continue running nations or building his church. Simply put, it is about the heart of the person, not the stature or how ruddy their cheeks are. John Maxwell, the, the great thinker on Christian leadership, once said, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The leader adjusts the sails. David adjusted the sails for the people of Israel. He adjusted the path for the Messiah to enter, for he was integral for God's divine plan. Jesus was the solution for, to the ways of the world. We know that God will not flood the world again. So what does it matter? What harm can it do? The harm will be brought to light on the day of Jesus' return. He is coming back and we will all face the truth of how we have lived and the decisions we made, the ones we repented and the ones we buried under the backdoor mat. I'll leave the last portion to the great Christian watchman Nee, who said, Outside of Christ, I am only a sinner, but in Christ, I am saved. Outside of Christ, I am empty, in Christ, I am full. Outside of Christ, I am weak, in Christ, I am strong. Outside of Christ, I cannot, in Christ, I am more than able. Outside of Christ, I have been defeated. In Christ, I am vic already victorious. How meaningful are the words in Christ. Amen. We're now going to spend some time praying for the world and for the church. Oh God. You are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enlighten your church so that the good news of your grace may take root and grow throughout our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we bring to you our world and we pray at this time for the G7 Summit now being held in Cornwall. 
and we pray for the key issues set to be discussed. We pray for equality with the vaccine rollout, where supplies are insufficient to denote to donate to developing nations at this time. We pray for help for the poorer countries where this has brought about the collapse of their healthcare systems and healthcare workers are unprotected and unsafe. We pray for wisdom for Joe Biden as he prepares to meet with Vladimir Putin in Geneva and ask for support from other leaders as they prepare to confront Russian and Chinese aggression and threats to our security, both in Eastern Europe and online. We bring before you Amnesty International's report on China of mass imprisonment, torture and persecution against ethnic minorities as crimes against humanity and that the extreme measures being taken by Chinese authorities will cease that human rights and access to justice will prevail. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for your church. We pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Sovereign Lord, this house of worship belongs to you. Remind us to pray for all those in authority, for our bishop, for our leaders, our parish priests, and in our own parish, Reverend Tim and Reverend Jenny, and to encourage and inspire them to reach the goals you have put upon their hearts, and not to resort to gossip, to grumblings and complaints but to uplift the work of the hands of those servants you have called to this special work. Give us, as a parish, humility and grace to pray for and undergird our spiritual leaders, and not to allow the spirit of disunity and discontent to come amongst us. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for our community, for our families, and for ourselves. We thank you for the lesson today, that you look on the heart, that you see what men cannot see. Shine a torch deep into our hearts, deepen our intimacy with you, and bring us closer to the heart of God. Teach us your ways of true forgiveness towards others and especially our Christian brothers and sisters. Plant the passion of the Holy Spirit into our hearts to reach out to those around us and draw them into the love of the Gospel, to share the love of Christ that we are so privileged to have. Forgive us our complacency, where we think only of our own, of our own comforts in your church, and give us the desire to work together and equip us to grow your kingdom in our community as you have called us to do. Give us, Lord, the heart of David, whom you loved so much. Speak to us as we open our hearts today and sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make this wretch his treasure. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our yeah. prayer. Let us pray together before that projector goes out to Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we gather here today, let us confess with one voice and one heart, giving up to God those things that we carry within us. Heavenly Father, 
you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare for communion, yes, we're going to be singing How Deep the Father's Love.
the bread and wine of communion. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yes, he is worthy of our praise. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Therefore we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We praise you especially for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross offered once and for all time the one true sacrifice for sin, reconciling us to you and satisfying your just demands. By rising to new life, Jesus has secured eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, we can say together, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, after the meal, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord to proclaim our fellowship in his death. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us pray together. Eternal God, from whom all holy desires, all good purposes, and all just works proceed, give to your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and that free from the fear of our enemies, we may pass our time in trust and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Just to run through some notices for the week, only one I'll put up here. If you'd like to talk to me or catch up on any matters, please give me a call. You'll find it on the back of the pew sheet a mobile phone number. Ring it, and if it's not Monday, I will answer it. Monday being my uh, family day, I don't answer the phone on Mondays. But uh, there's nothing stopping people need to talk. Pick up the phone and give me a call. Next Sunday, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel. Again, it's kind of a broken up reading. It's what the lectionary does from time to time. It takes out all the good bits. But, uh, no, it doesn't. That moves things around. We're going to be looking at David and Goliath. The thing that made David stand out among the nation of his people. And when we look at the whole facts, we realize that Goliath should have been the one who was ter should, have, should have been terrified of David. And there was no reason because David had God on his side, but he also had one other thing. We'll look closer at that next week. Meantime, we're going to finish with standing and singing Oceans.
the Son of Righteousness shine upon you and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go out there and enjoy this beautiful sunshine. Stay warm because I think it's going to be cold nights for quite some time to come. God bless and have an incredible week. Thank you.